I'm the kind of person that will try anything. From studying abroad to athletics to theater, at Hiram, I have those opportunities. I've learned to ask what if a lot more and look at problems in different lights and to live in the moment. My goal as a student and in life is to have no regrets. Because of Hiram, I feel like I'm ready for the spotlight. At Hiram, I'm challenged to really think for myself. I've learned that there could be 50 right answers, not just one. My professors have been tough, but also so inspiring. They've really helped me find my focus. Life lessons are what I'm going to take with me from my diverse community of coaches, professors, and students. Hiram has expanded my viewpoints and my beliefs. To me, Hiram means family. You get a chance to know everyone personally. Transfer here is one of the best choices I have ever made. I try to humanize technology. I train students through Hiram's tech and track program so that they can use these resources to work smarter. Every day I see students working to solve complex real world challenges. I truly enjoy fostering those conversations. All right, so I got that. I'll see you later. Okay, see ya. People make the difference here. I've built relationships with my professors and my peers. So for me, Hiram is a really helpful, supportive environment. I'm learning more than what's in a syllabus or a course description. I'm figuring out how to network and get involved. Howdy, Mary. Helping people is my passion, so I'm studying science and healthcare, but I'm also learning a lot about who I am. By taking care of the people, the animals, and the environment here, I know I can make lives better. I came to Hiram for a degree, but I'm leaving with so much more. I am ready. Prepared. A work in progress. I am passionate. Bright. Confident. I am the new liberal arts. I am. I am. I am. Hiram. Hiram. Visit Hiram.edu. Welcome to Fireside Chats. 60 minutes of stimulating conversation with some of Northeast Ohio's most interesting entrepreneurs. Get the inside story from folks who have taken the leap and who are willing to share what they've learned, the good, the bad, and the inspiring. Fireside Chats, real entrepreneurs, real stories, real learning. Fireside Chats are brought to you by the Center for Integrated Entrepreneurship at Hiram College. Be sure to look for our Fireside Chat podcasts where you can listen on your own time and our dime. For more information, visit hiram.edu backslash entrepreneurship. Now, let's get chatting. Welcome everybody to our next installment of Fireside Chats here at Hiram College and welcome to those of our students here uh, in the forum today and to those of you viewing uh, via live streaming. So tonight we're pleased to have with us Drew Anderson. He is one of the co-founders of Cleveland Kraut. Yes, that is Kraut as in sauerkraut. And uh, he's here to share his story, how he and his uh, brother and brother-in-law uh, came upon the idea of uh, starting a sauerkraut business here in Cleveland and why they love Kraut and how they're doing. So without further ado, we'll welcome Drew to tell his story. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Cool. So guys, um, you know, I can only assume thousands of people that are watching for the web. <laughs> um, thanks for coming out. My name is Drew, I'm the CEO of Cleveland Kraut. Um, We'll get into kind of the backstory and tell you how I started the business, where we're at now, and how we're growing everything. But I do have some swag. So I have two hats. These are fresh, actually from Bade Stitched in Cleveland. I'm going to ask a couple questions, whoever, you know, whoever has the answers. Does anybody know how fermentation like sauerkraut actually occurs? Through uh, acidic acids, something like that, solidic acids. 
Lactic acid. Yeah. Acid, lactic acid, yeah. Yeah, that'll work. Let's do it. All right. I need two benefits of probiotics. That's not a benefit of probiotics. Sorry, man. Okay, benefit of sauerkraut, this is cabbage. Probiotic. Nobody's ever heard of it? All right. Jenkins, your immune system? And digestive system? Yeah, this guy's got Google. <laughs> All right. What do you mean? <laughs> excellent, excellent, thanks. Those are fresh. That's legend headwear out of Cleveland, too. Those are high. Um, anyway, so we, again, my name is Drew. I run Cleveland Crop. We are a nationally distributed sauerkraut manufacturer out of Cleveland. Um, we specifically work in fermented foods, which have a lot to do with lactic acid. It's a natural preservation process. So, uh, going back, started the company about five years ago. I have a degree in statistics, and I uh, was a banker uh, in Virginia for, I don't know, four years or so. And out there, growing up in Cleveland, you get like pierogi, sauerkraut, kielbasa, you go to the, the baseball game, there's a hot dog, there's sauerkraut on it. I love sauerkraut, right? Out there in Virginia, like I couldn't get that Eastern European fare. And so we were, uh, just in my apartment, I was fermenting sauerkraut as a hobby, like guys will do beer or wine or something like that. I was doing sauerkraut. And I was cranking out sausages with a uh, handheld meat grinder. I hate making pierogies, but I tried. Um, and then I moved back. Key Bank hired me, so I moved back, and I was working downtown at Key. And it turns out my the guy who's going to marry my sister, now my brother-in-law, uh, Luke, he was making sauerkraut as well, which is odd for some, you know mid-twenties guys to be doing. And over a beer one night, we're eating some sauerkraut that he made, and I'm like, man, this is, this is good. Uh, this is crunchy, this is delicious, this is vibrant. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of trends. Out of California, fermented foods were like becoming a big thing. Probiotic foods becoming a big thing. Um, how, you know, what happens in California, what happens in the coast gets to the Midwest like a couple years later, right? You know, like kale was big in the 90s or something now. We're all about kale and whatnot. Um, so in tandem with that, I was I grew up in food. So my mother started all the farmers markets around Cleveland. She was a chef and biologist, so I was worried about what she's feeding us. I'm six six. My brother's six nine. We ate good food. We ate good growing up, and a lot of that is the diet. And so I was always working farmers markets over the weekends. Um, uh, you know, in high school, I was responsible for a market on the weekends, just hustling every every Saturday, every Sunday mornings up at six, working markets. It sucked for my social life, but yeah, it was fun. Um, but that being said, I wanted to get back to food. I was done with banking. I was done with stats. I was like, I want to get back to food. I want to start a business. You know, here's this product that is odd. It's not a hot category. People are like sauerkraut. It's, it's gold, you know? Um, and so we're like, well, what if we reinvent it? What if we, if we take it to the next level? What if we, instead of pasteurizing it, instead of putting in preservatives and making it unhealthy, we keep it alive and fresh? We started uh, at a commercial kitchen downtown and started taking it to farmer's markets. And like the first day, so we had we had launched our Instagram first and it just kind of tracked everything we were doing. Uh, prior to our first launch at farmer's markets, we got to this indoor farmer's market in February 2014. We had these big barrels full of sauerkraut. We were gonna do deli style. And the entire farmer's market smelled like but just sauerkraut. It just was nasty. And just the way, it, that's what sauerkraut smells like. When I open these bags, or you get to try it, you're going to be like, what the hell is that? It's just the way it smells. And so the entire market was smelling like this. And people were like, what the heck is that? So they lined up, and uh, we sold out. And started from there. So for about a year of working, essentially, you know, three to four nights a week, we were in a commercial kitchen until about 2, 3 in the morning. Then we'd go to our banking job. I was you know, working key, my brother-in-law is an architect, and then my younger brother is our head of sales. He was in finance at Jones Day in another firm downtown. And so we would do that at night, go to our jobs on the weekend, sell at farmer's markets. Um, we started getting a lot of press from like, you know, little articles here, little articles there, and we said chefs started to come to us, right? Like Michael Simon, um, he's an iron chef, and you guys know Michael Simon, out of Cleveland, right? He started sending his guys to buy product, and uh, 
do one-off events. You know, he's, he knows how to make really good sauerkraut, but when you have big barrels of this stuff in your restaurant, it tends to smell up the restaurant. If the barrel goes bad, then you, you know, you gotta take it off the menu, but like, so we could make it for it. Um, now we're on Mabel's downtown, all this B-spot pickle bars we just went to is opening of Mabel's barbecue restaurant, the Palms in Vegas in December. For the soft opening, we're served on the Narnar, the spicy one here, served on every single plate uh, at that restaurant. It's great, they use a ton of products. Um, but so we see the chefs kind of early on, we're starting to get in our products. And so then we heard Heinen's, the local chain, you guys know Heinen's, right? I uh, was wanting a retail pack, so we're like, all right, let's, let's you know, get a designer. And late 2015, we, we launched our glass jar product. Uh, we went into Heinen's, a, you know, a couple of delis, and uh, I think Giant Eagle Market District, the nicer market districts. Um, and that's when we launched. And now, so it's the end of 2015, now uh, we're sold in over 40 states. Um, we're in places like Target, all the Giant Eagles, Whole Foods, uh, Walmart's testing us in 200 stores. Probably going to launch us to a couple hundred more this year. Uh, a week and a half ago, I was in Tokyo and Hong Kong uh, selling sauerkraut. And uh, we're, like for 2017, uh, we got Forbes 30 into 30 um, in food, which is really cool, unexpected for a sauerkraut company. Odd. We make it all right here in, in Cleveland, um, naturally fermented. The, the difference between our product and like the generic bag product is uh, we do it on pasteurized. We do a natural fermentation. So uh, about 30 days it's sitting in big totes, big barrels. And uh, what happens is, is there's probiotics, bacteria, right? And they eat the sugars in the cabbage and they offput CO2 and lactic acid. And it makes, it's a, it's a natural preservation of sauerkraut. So Thousands of years ago, you know, you know, hundreds of years ago, even, uh, or still to this day, and farmers would take, you know, whatever they've sold or traded or whatever in the fields is gone. They take whatever was left, leaves, cabbage, whatever they could find, vegetables, throw it into barrels, salt it down, weigh it down, and put that in the cellar or the or the barn or something. And over the winter, as it fermented, it, it stayed preserved. It stayed good. It stayed healthy. You can eat it, and that's what they would eat for vegetables throughout the winter time. So essentially we're doing the same process. We've added some cool flavors and you know we put some good branding on it and launched, right? So it's pretty simple. Now we're getting into, now we're becoming more than just a sauerkraut company. We're getting into other fermented, other pickled, um, you know, exciting products, you know, dressings and, and pickles and things like that. For sauerkraut, it's like, you know, probably total market size, including food service, it's probably maybe a billion dollar market. So how big can you actually get as just a sauerkraut company? And we're changing the way people, you know, earlier you said you don't eat sauerkraut. Um, it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, we change the way people think about sauerkraut. So they try it and they're like, this is different. This is crunchy, this is vibrant. So we're growing the category, we're making it bigger. But as we get into these other fermented pickled areas, we're looking at three billion, four billion dollar markets with significantly more opportunity, uh, but still fits within our wheelhouse. So it's it's exciting. Um, that's kind of the basis and the background of the business we're building here. Uh, we are venture backed. Um, to this date, we raised you know over four million dollars in venture funding and. Uh, from you know, the second largest cabbage grower in the United States is an investor of ours. Uh, we've got a VC out of Chicago. Kraft Heinz is a small investment in us. Um, actually, over the summer, we had, um, you're starting to see, what's interesting about starting a food company is it follows the same track as like a tech company in the sense that you could start out some unique product, something that's different, like a, a cool app or a piece of software um, or, you know, sauerkraut, something like that, and you change the way, uh, you know, people view it, and you, you attract users, you attract consumers, and maybe you take in some funding, and you start to grow the business, and you get traction, right? Uh, and you get bigger and bigger, and eventually, uh, you can do a couple of things. You can, 
you know, be like Facebook and just continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Or you can be like, you know, Snapchat and go IPO. Um, or, you know, there's buyers though. Essentially Google, um, Facebook bought Instagram, right? Um, it's the same for the food companies. RX Bar, you guys familiar with RX Bar? Um, it's just like a little little protein bar that started at Chicago. Mm -hmm. They sold the Kellogg last year for $600 million. Protein bar, right? So there's Primal Kitchen, it's a dressing company you guys probably have never heard of. They have like little protein, keto things, or whatever, they sold $200 million to Kraft Heinz uh, in December. So there's the same trajectory. So you're able to get, um, if you build a company, you get traction. Uh, if that's the way you want to exit, exits are out there. And so there's big companies like Pepsi, Nestle, um, Kraft Heinz. They're looking for innovative companies to buy. Um, and it makes it attractive space for investors as well. So we've been lucky enough to, to be able to get some of that investment. Um, I don't know whether we'll ever sell, but it's kind of interesting to look at. Um, but over the summer, we did get you know Kraft Heinz and a lot of these other uh, big CBG companies are starting incubators. They're finding it very difficult to do this innovative work uh, within their companies to have these like creative ideas to build something that's authentic, that's real, um, and build it up into a big brand. They just have these legacy brands, Kraft cheese, Kraft macaroni and cheese, you know, like they're it's legacy brand. How do they make that cool? How do they come up with some competitor? And so they're starting incubator programs. And so we were lucky enough out of 500 companies, uh, they narrowed it down. They took five companies. One of us, we were one of the ones included, and over the summer we had to get an apartment in Chicago where Kraft is headquartered, and we worked with Kraft and their R&D team and their marketing team um, for four months. And it was amazing. It's really cool. You can see how you know the fifth largest food conglomerate in the world operates. It's super, super exciting. Um, you know, and our relationship is great. You know, they have a small investment in us. You know. Possible that they might want to purchase us someday, but we get to use, we get to lean on like a big brother, right? I don't know if you guys follow like stock market, they're having a rough, uh, they're having a pretty rough week, <laughs> but um, it's nothing to do with us. But like, you know, I emailed the chief marketing officer of Kraft before I went to Tokyo, and I said, hey, we're going to be in Tokyo, we're going to this food show, can you guys help me out? Plugs us in, and I get to meet Kraft Tokyo, and they're out there helping us. Um, so you, it's an interesting, something that's so small and odd, sauerkraut, you know, you can build into something that's remarkable and big um, and becomes exciting now. Did I think I was going to be selling sauerkraut in Tokyo when I started this company? Yeah. <laughs> but it's exciting. It's fun. Now I'm here, so do it, you know. Um, but I guess I would go over kind of our marketing strategy. It's a, Interesting way we market, uh, our main business is retail packs uh, on store shelves. And the interesting part about our product and the difficulty really is that most people you ask them, do you like sauerkraut, they're going to say no. So how do you change someone's behavior? Uh, you have to essentially influence them <laughs> to try it, or you got to get them to try it somehow. And then they can realize that, wow, this is actually good for me, and it's tasty, and it's crunchy, and X, Y, and Z. I might become a buyer. I might become a consumer, consumer of this. So we spend a lot of marketing dollars on influencing people. So this is our uh, Instagram. It's great for food companies, right? You have all these beautiful recipes, pictures. You have influencers like um, Karen. <laughs> And she has, you know, she has some sort of diet or food blog or something, and people follow her, and she reps our product. You do interesting little recipes, and people are like, wow, I never thought of a product like that. You put a dog next to your product. That always sells. Um, but healthy foods, um, you know, anything with bacon on it, all this type of, like, how do I, how do I get people to use my product and, and become a, a, you know, a buyer over and over again. Uh, and that's, that's key here. So you do interesting videos and, and demoing, essentially. So we have 
people across the country every single day in grocery stores, Targets, Walmarts, uh, Whole Foods, and they are demoing sauerkraut they get. A little stand there, you know, I think we have 50 some odd people out. Um, and we're doing 175 demos a month. So they're just, try it, try it, here's a coupon, try it out. And you start to get turns, and then you start to get traction. Um, and you push people towards, you know, you're building a customer base. Hopefully, we have this great customer base who trusts our products, and when we start releasing products outside of sauerkraut, then they, uh, they're like, yeah, I trust them to make a good product, I want to try this new stuff. And we build this base of customers and new products. So you start doing like, you know, we partner with Sriracha, um, where they'll, you know, post us, we post them, and do a giveaway or something like that, where we send Sriracha and crowd. Um, we were shown this a lot in Tokyo. They didn't believe that you could put it with ramen. But anyway, there's a, it's, just, it's just trying to educate the consumer on how you, uh, you use a product and you get more and more uses. So. Um, yeah. so a question. You, so you went to Tokyo. Is there a bigger market for sauerkraut in Tokyo than maybe here because they do more, they eat more fermented food? Um, well, the United States is the biggest market, right? So Asia is going to be a, uh, kind of not a priority for us, but we're still going to go after it. They eat fermented foods every day, right? Whether it's, it's nothing like sauerkraut, it's a different flavor, but you know, South Korea is like a kimchi, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but they, they do like soybeans, and they do plums, and they do all these crazy pickled items. And so they understand the product, which makes it easier to sell to them. Um, so the market is big, um, and it is fruitful. They don't seem to care about the, the same selling points, though. They don't really care about probiotics over there. They don't really care about crunchy. Um, because a lot of what they eat, like they're used to so many different textures. The crunchiness of the product, they're like, oh, that's interesting. But it wasn't like a selling point here. It's like, oh, it's crunchy. I've never had sauerkraut. It's crunchy. This is amazing. I'm buy this. It's like a pickle. Um, where there, it's just not a big deal. What they really liked was the packaging. <laughs> they were like, wow, it's so cute. And uh, But can you make it way smaller? We need it this big. Uh, because they, they have no space over there. Everything's tiny. Uh, that was a giant. <laughs> um, that, that trip was eye-opening, but yes, it's a it's a, a good market for us. I think it's going to be big, but it's going to take two or three years to really see a mature market out of that, and it's going to take some education, and it's going to take a repack. Um, but I think there are some opportunities because they're so familiar with fermented foods that uh, we'll be able to get in a little bit faster. Yeah, so. I'm excited. Um, Hong Kong is interesting too. The Chinese eat something similar to a, a sauerkraut often for breakfast with like a kanji soup. Uh, but in Hong Kong, like nobody cooks. Everybody eats out. Um, everyone's familiar with Hong Kong. It's just like a, it's, it's a wild city. But everybody eats out. So now we're having to, we're going to sell food service to them. We're going to sell big pails. They're going to go in salads, they're going to go in, uh, you know, German restaurants, things like that. Um, so it's just, you know, you have to approach each market differently. But yeah, it'll, it'll be good. It'll be good. Not, uh, not as big as the United States market, though. So yeah. Uh, if you guys want questions, we can talk, discussion or whatever. Uh, do, do you think it'd be worth trying to market anywhere in Germany, or do they just have a uh, their own kind of crowd business that they... So, what's interesting about the German market is, um, one, we, we can, I would love to go over there and get in any, like, because they like, like, you know, beer competitions, they have sauerkraut competitions and things like that, that we would crush. Um, we get a lot of German, um, so our social media person is German, our website designer is German, we, for some reason, we attract a lot of crowds, <laughs> a lot of Germans. Uh, they love the product. It's better than anything that is made in Germany. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, problem with Germany is their food costs are so low. Their food is super cheap there, and we're still a premium product. 
we are achieving scale right now, and we're, our factory is growing and growing. But to get it over there and refrigerated, um, you know, pallets, it's going to be it's gonna be expensive. Whereas like Hong Kong and even Tokyo, we can charge a little more. Um, so it's going to take a little, a little bit of time, but yeah, absolutely, Europe will be a big market for us. So we're having uh, there's a there's a class at CSU who's traveling to London, and there's a team who's doing a whole research project on how our product would do in the UK. So that's a you know Europe would be a big market for us. Um, just to say in general, um, you know the Asia trip was cool. The US government paid for half that trip. That's why we went. Um, but the United States market is our primary focus. There's so much to do here, and we haven't even touched, like, uh, you know, we haven't even dipped our toe in, so a lot of opportunities still here, but yeah, it, uh, Europe would be great. Uh, I, I was starting to website that you had a thing that said on the press one of us, and it had uh, ESP on there. Yeah. Did ESP, like, um, did the number about you guys, like, did that, like, help your sales grow at all, or? Uh, so, are you guys Cavs fans, or? Yeah, I miss LeBron. But, yeah. Who's that? <laughs> uh, so George Hill's an investor. Um, George Hill was, you know, he's on the box now. Um, but he, I'm trying to find a picture. He's still pretty cool. Yeah, he's a great dude. Uh, so he actually invested in us when he was playing with the Jazz. <laughs> so we knew him before. We like to say we influenced. There he is. Hey. So like, um, not my best picture, but George looks great. <laughs> so he invested in us um, 2017, and then we were super pumped when he came to Cleveland because we're like, great for the Cavs, great for the business, and my social life just got way better. <laughs> I didn't get really get to hang out with that much, but he's a great dude. He's just a, he's a family guy. Uh, we did a charity event in Salt Lake. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just uh, Park City, Park City. Every year he does a charity event for veteran families where he gives like half a million dollars or something split across like five families, uh, veterans who are in need. And so we got invited out, we were made friends with his agent uh, randomly. We got invited out and he was like, can you do the food? And so we just cook sausages and crap for all the Utah Jazz and all these people. And and they were like, right, great, man, these guys, these guys hustle with you. They grind, like, when you guys need some cash, what's that? And then we're super pumped when he came to Cleveland, obviously. Uh, but he's a great dude, and I'm happy to see he's on the box because it's the squad right there. Um, but yeah, so ESPN, what is it, undefeated or un undisputed did an article on his uh, investment. Uh, they, so they sent you know, the ESPN writers, because it's the ESPN site, out and toured our factory and interviewed us and, and whatnot. So it's cool. Yeah. Again, sauerkraut. Who knew? Who the hell knew? You said something about like the pickle market or something like that, or there's $3 billion there you can mess with. Like, do you think there's anything wrong with like spreading yourself, or, like diving into different markets versus Staying in the one year right now, just really just taking it completely over. Or what do you think? Is there anything? Because I don't know. I'm just wondering. So you, there's, there's, you know, you, you can look at. There's too like focused, and then there's too much, right? Um, we could totally focus on sauerkraut. The biggest manufacturing in the United States is about a 200 million dollar company out of Wisconsin, and they make all the sauerkraut for like they co-pack for brands that compete against us, so they make their sauerkraut for them. They make all the cheap stuff that's in bags. They make the stuff that's in, like, uh, you know, the, the, the corner car in downtown Cleveland. And they have a ton of different brands. And they'll just, if, they, if there's an opportunity to make sauerkraut, they will do it. We're more focused. We're building a brand, right? We could go and say, yeah, we're going to compete directly with them, and we're going to take Wegmans, you know, is looking for private label sauerkraut. You know, at some point, Walmart will want their own brand of sauerkraut, and we can go and fight for that. And we'll give a better quality, it'll be a higher price point, and we can fight for that business and totally focus on sauerkraut. It's a long, it's a long-term play. It's definitely something we're looking at. But what excites us is building a brand. And when you're building a brand, you need to have constant innovation, and you need to bring new products to the forefront. 
So one of the things we're doing within Sour Crowd is we'll have limited time offers. So you guys are familiar with like Johnsonville Brats, right? <coughs> Big company. Um, they have seasonal brats that come out, and it keeps people engaged. Like, oh man, the you know the March uh, St. Patrick's Day brats out, you know. So we're getting into that as well. So it keeps people engaged, keeps people focused and excitement around sauerkraut. But you got to look at a brand. You got to see like how how can you stretch? How can you stretch the brand? I can't go out and make uh, milkshakes, right? Or with margaritas, Cleveland crab margaritas. This is like that doesn't make sense. There's no connection here. But things that are cured and pickled uh, and also fermented, that's within the wheelhouse. That makes sense. So we put it under a slightly different name. It'll be Cleveland Kitchen, right? We've got that trademarked. Um, and you know we can kind of grow a little bit, right? And stretch a little bit. It makes sense that that product would, would, would fit for us, right? And then you keep getting bigger. And, and then when you're a, a, just like a brand name, a family name, you know? You can have products that are completely different, but it makes sense. Like, yeah, their 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 thing is culinary. They make really good products, and they started here, and now they're here. But it makes sense. So you have to do it slowly if you're going to do it. Uh, we learned this by working with uh, um, is that MSJ is her name, but she was the head of strategy uh, at Kraft Times over the summer, and she was teaching us how to build. We we specifically asked her, how do I build a hundred hundred million dollar brand? Like. That's the goal. Like, how do I do? How do I do that? And she told us about how do you stretch and how do you stay in your wheelhouse, but like keep pushing the boundaries until you become known for instead of just sauerkraut, your culinary brand, right? She actually last month she's now the chief marketing officer of Court Miller Course. She just highest female I think ever in that company. So big props to her, but she knows what she's talking about. But it's just incremental, you know. We're not going to go out and do something completely different. Fermented pickles, that's in the wheelhouse. Yeah. Vinegars, things like that. Yeah. Yep. Are you guys all like, is this the minor? Like, you guys are getting an entrepreneurship minor? Is that the crew here? Some are. Some yeah. are. Yeah? Okay, cool. Any good ideas out there? Are you doing anything? Wish. <laughs> oh, <laughs> So you're the CEO. Yeah. And so what? Your other brother and your brother-in-law are still. What are their roles? So Luke, my brother-in-law is. Uh, he's the CEO, right? So chief operating officer handles production and managing. We've got like a 15-person production team, manages all that. And then my brother, my brother is the chief marketing officer. So he handles all sales, heads up marketing initiatives. And We've got a CFO, and he's out in Calistoga, San Francisco. So who comes up with the different flavors? The, who's the innovator? You're looking at him. You? Yeah, so I work on, I basically head up R&D. So uh, early on, a lot of these flavors were helped. We, you know, we got a lot of chefs in, involved, and they were helping us. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, I learned to cook from my mother, and uh, just like, I like flavors, so I, I usually do the innovation. Uh, that's not to say that my brother-in-law and my brother haven't had significant impact on the flavors, but yeah. So. And um, you said you're national, so are you in all 50 states? Or? We are. We will be by probably July. We're about 40 states now. Pride of Cleveland, sauerkraut. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Where do you guys manufacture this? Our manufacturing facility is 77 from Carnegie, uh, right by Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. Was the hardest part like getting people like to like you know know your product really know what you know product is and everything like you know was that the hard, the most difficult part about you know getting people to know your brand? There's uh, there's a ton of difficulties like that was that was definitely an issue you know like. Initially, we had difficulties. We named the Cleveland Crowd, and we had trouble because you know we were too small-minded. We thought by naming it a regional company like that, and we had to expand quickly. But um, it turns out people think that sauerkraut and fermented foods should come from a place like Cleveland. So in Southern California, they're like, "Yeah, yeah, those Cleveland guys—they know what they're doing. I'm buying this stuff." Like, and so that works out. But then educating people on you know why this is better than 
something else. You're charging like you know five ninety nine for a pouch, where you can get the crap sauerkraut for two ninety nine, right? So why is it better? Well, it's much better for you health wise. It's crunchier. We've got all these flavors in it. We do it the real way. It's authentic. Da, 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 da. So yeah, education is, is huge, man. Absolutely huge. Uh, getting, but the real the biggest challenge is to get these buyers with these big <coughs> chains to like give us a shot. Man. You got to go in there and you got to like, we're, we're working on like Publix for three years, dude. We were on Kroger for three years and finally got the meeting, you know, and they're going to put us nationwide, but like, do you know how much cash that takes to like float a company <laughs> for three years? <laughs> like, it's, yeah, that's tough. Like, how do you go in and you convince a buyer who doesn't give a, a rat's ass about sauerkraut? take on this line, you know? And then, then how do you get them to not charge you like $10,000 for, for the space on the shelf? So it is all, that's that's a real difficulty, difficulty yeah. So. It paid off. What's that? It's, it paid off in the long run. It, it will pay off, it hasn't paid off yet. <laughs> I'm still in it, man. I'm still, the struggle's still, still happening. But yeah, it's working out, man. Yeah, it's working out. Shit, go ahead. What about like sports teams and things like that? Have you planned on trying to get into like the stadiums and uh, right. sport parks? Great question. We never used to have the scale or we're able to get to the cost that they need. Uh, but we just landed the Cincinnati Reds moving all their sauerkraut to the crowd. Indians, our third meeting with them was on Friday. They're coming in again. Uh, we're close. The group that runs that also runs 13 other stadiums. Um, so we're, we're there. We're, we're right about there. We're, they're going to start falling. You can find us on menus, like in the Brown Stadium. Michael Simon's spot has us on there. You know, I think that in the Indians and in the Loges, every once in a while they have our sauerkraut. You know, it's just kind of like the premium stuff. We're going for every hot dog stand. It's our sauerkraut. You know, and not only just one flavor of the classic, but we want like the spicy one too. Um, so, you know, Indians is not a done deal. We'll see what happens. <laughs> We don't give them this year, we give them next year, right? So it takes scale though. You gotta like you your real premium product and you can't even they, they come and tell you what the price is they need that, you're just it, there's no way. There's no way. Uh, we, we will just go out of business trying to get that price. But now, you know, it took five years to get there, but now we can play. We play with the big boys, so mm -hmm. So you mentioned you changed your packaging because you used to be in jars and you went to these pouches because Pouches were easier to automate for yeah. filling. Yeah. So, um, what's your capacity? I mean, how much can you produce in a day, or however you measure it? Sure, we'll do about two million pounds each this year. Yeah. And how Which many? Two million pounds this year. Sauerkraut. Yeah. So, how many bags is two million pounds? Two million bags. Oh, so each yeah. each bag's a pound. Yeah. I mean, that's the equivalent portion of that two million pounds is going to be in food service containers. Uh -huh. Uh, Costco is testing us out. Uh, we'll be doing a 32 ounce pouch for them. Um, so yeah, it's it's you know, it's gonna be it, you know, it, essentially we look at pounds total. And it'll be about two million, which is about five x from last year. So I, what is Narnar? Narnar? <coughs> it's Narnar. Like oh, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know about that with that blow. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, the Narda, when we started, we were like in my mom's cellar and we just had 20 some odd concoctions going. And three of those jars were spicy, kind of the, the prerequisite to the Narda. And we're like, we needed a spicy crowd. And that one in particular has a very pungent odor to it when it's fermenting. Uh, and we're like, dude, this is gnarly, like, you know. Wants to be so gnarly, <laughs> and my mom is like, "What is that nardar?" She's like, hey, "I had to go down and do the laundry, and it smells like this gnarly sauerkraut." And she's like, "What's nardar? What are you nardar?" And we're like, "All right, nardar." Like, we're going nardar. Got that mug trademarked, and now we're suing surfers all over. <laughs> now, and so, but yeah, so that's that's the story behind it. Um, it's kind of cool. It works out. It's the only one that has like a really odd uh, kind of goofy name to it and it's it's like chef's favorite so michael simon uses that all the time that one's you know it crushes it so that's the story uh, which one's your favorite no no <laughs> no no and roasted roasted garlic 
Somebody came out to us and was like, why don't you call the roast and roasties? <laughs> like, right, we can't, can't, can't go that far. But yeah, so now I like the spicy, like the roast. They just go on everything. I eat sauerkraut almost every day. When I started this company, I was like 5'4". I don't sauerkraut, man. Let me get some of that. Eat a bag of that. <laughs> eat a bag of that. Four bags. So one of our, there is a viewer out there watching and uh, submitted a question that said, what are the three largest hurdles encountered in forming the company? And when you look back, what would you do now differently uh, when you were first formed the company? Start a brewery or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, three biggest hurdles. Like I was telling you, I, I think it's sales of a product that's not in a super hot category. So it's, you're banging your head against you know these big retailers' doors constantly until they let you in. And as soon as you get in, that is your retailer to lose. So as soon as you get in, it's the next hurdle is how do you stay on those shelves? You need to get turns. Like these things need to move. You need to get people on the ground floor selling that sauerkraut. You're hitting like targeted Instagram posts to the area where you know they're. 100 Wegmans are in New York or whatever it is. And so it's getting in, staying on the shelf, and then probably just operations in general. Man creating a manufacturing plant from nothing is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult because now you manage like 15 people and they all have their own you know, agendas, issues, whatever it is. Some of them are great, some of them, you know, we used to turn like five people a month would quit. You know how difficult that is, the constant, how much time it takes to like go out and find new people. And partly because our process was so difficult. We didn't have streamline, we didn't have scale, we didn't know what the heck we're doing, we're not manufacturers. So like, it's so difficult to do that. Uh, it's also a good thing, because nobody really wants to do it, because they fail trying, you know? We can do it, you know, it's a barrier to entry, right? So, nobody else wants to. So I would say getting into the stores, staying on the shelves, marketing, and then actually just building a manufacturing plant. That's a whole beast. A lot of these products you see out there, cool, trendy brands, they don't make the product. There's some bigger company that they pay to make the product. And they're just a marketing company. So uh, being a manufacturer is extremely difficult. Uh, doing something different, I mean, there's, there's it's an endless list, man. <laughs> Part of, I'm sure you guys, in your courses, you say this over and over again. Failure is just an everyday type of thing. You're going to mess up. You're going to screw up. You're going to piss somebody off. You're going to drop the ball on something. Every single day, you're going to screw up. And the next day, you wish you hadn't done that. So there's a million things. But you just learn constantly. I'm compared to a year now, compared to five years now, yeah, I'm a way better CEO. I know how to deal with people way better. Five years from now, two years from now, I'm going to be even better, you know. So it's constant, screw up, learn from it, keep going. Uh, if you can keep doing that, then, you know, you'll be a success. But if you let them win, then you lose your business. <laughs> so you mentioned the program with Kraft, and you talked about um, the RX bars that recently uh, so, um, but it sounded like you're not, you and your partners don't have an exit strategy yet, or you're not interested in an exit strategy? You having, mean, a, having a good time? You want to see how big you can go with this? What's you, it's, I mean, it's the CEO, you have a tailored answer for every person who's asking, right? Investors, you need to know this thing, you know, the general public wants to know this thing. Um, there's always the price. Like, you know, if we get it to a certain point and someone offers an insane number, like, that's going to be hard to turn down, right? But the fact of the matter, none of that matters unless we execute it today. And so the way to get to build a valuable, good company is you're building the brand up. You're, you're constantly, I mean, we're really a brand. We need to make sure that we are everywhere, that people recognize us, they love the products. The people that uh, work for us are happy and they know that if they do well, the company does well and they'll get, you know, incentivized, uh, you know, they'll get the incentives that they deserve. They, you're building a really strong company so that five years down the line, I can look at all those options and say, yeah, right, you know, we're, gonna, we're, we're done, we're going to sell to so-and-so. 
you know, we're going to get bigger, we're going to go IPO um, and become a public company. Or, you know what, we're just going to keep grinding, this is going to be a 40 year company, I'm going to hand it down to my kids. Yeah. You kind of have some vision in mind about, you know, yesterday I'm like, I sell this thing tomorrow. Like, <laughs> it's brutal. Today I'm like, yeah, let's go IPO. I want to be a publicly traded CEO and just deal with Wall Street, you know? And some days I'm like, man, it'd be super cool if I have a kid someday he comes in and he's working at the factory, you know? But none of it matters if you don't execute today, so. Yeah. So we must have a connoisseur here because somebody wants to know, have you ever sampled some of the old German brands like Luchtenberg sauerkraut, which was started in 1861? No. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. Yeah, there's a ton of brands out there. Um, that would be cool. I'd love to get over there and try some. Somebody's typing, so they're going to come up with something else. So, so uh, you're manufacturing uh, as a whole. So what's your what was your cost like two year, uh, four years ago to what your cost is now? Because you were talking about how it's hard to get over into like Germany or into the sports parks. So how did that make a big difference? Is it like your ordering size or is it just mainly volume output? It's both, yeah. It's both. So it's a scale. It's a scale question. Mm -hmm. One, so you go in and for me, as a startup making limited sauerkraut selling to a handful, but I couldn't get to the big cabbage distributors. They're like, no, you're too small. We're never going to deal with you. So I had to go to the distributor sales the restaurants, which means the cost is going to be, you know, 60 cents a pound cabbage, right? You know, I'm paying a third of that now. Um, you know, the jars, we were paying all in on the, the jar cost. You know, when we first started, it was like 80 cents a jar. You know, all those costs add up, and then you try to get some profit in there, and it's like, man, we were, we were eating it for, for a while. We've, you know, lost money, a lot of money. Um, but now, you know, our gross margins by the end of this year are going to be 60-some-odd percent. So it's a healthy, sustainable business. As a manufacturer, you want to be north of 50 um, to, you know, be able to kind of handle the overhead. Uh, but it's, I mean, we're... The cost for one of these, I think the quality is better. Our processes are cleaner and safer and, and better, and we're producing a much higher quality product. But we're our costs are you know a fourth of what they were maybe even three years ago, four years ago. Mm -hmm. But it is about buying more, buying more and being able to get to the source. Big companies they don't want to deal with you. You're small, like you're a pain in the butt. You, you don't have the right, you know, who knows who you're gonna pay, you know. You're only going to order a small amount. Just go through a distributor. We don't talk to you. Talk to me when you're moving two million pounds of sauerkraut out of here. And that's nothing too. Like these guys out in Wisconsin are putting up big, big numbers. So we got a long way to go. What's the shelf like? Of Twelve months from pack day. Four months. Twelve months from pack day. Twelve months. Twelve months. Okay. Year. Year, year. And then what about Cleveland as a place to do a startup to be a, a young entrepreneur? What's happening? You know, is Cleveland the place to be? Is it? Um, so for food companies, no, it's not. <laughs> okay. uh, short answer, but then I'll tell you why we like it here. Uh, for food startups, you want to be in uh, Brooklyn, uh, Boulder, Colorado, Austin, uh, San Francisco, but even you know Chicago's much more. There's way more uh, sources of capital. There's way more kitchens. There's way more manufacturers everywhere else. Uh, but we like Cleveland, um, not only because it's our hometown and we know you can be a big fish here. Like, you can get to the top. You can start talking to the people who run the city a lot quicker. You try to do that in Chicago, you try to do that, you're never going to, it's going to take years and years and years before you, you start to like meet the people who are actually moving and shaking in those cities. So here we can be a big fish. Land is really cheap, manufacturing is cheap. We also have some of the best soil in the country. We have a super, super great agricultural uh, you know, economy here. So starting a food company in Ohio, I don't know why more companies don't do it. Uh, because it's so easy to get good product. It's so easy and cheap to manufacture. The quality of life is you know, great. I mean, if you're a millionaire here, 
not saying I'm anywhere near a millionaire, but if you're a millionaire here, you're living like a kid. You're a millionaire in New York City, you're just kind of like, yeah, it's, it's, this guy's basically homeless. No. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it's totally different. Yeah. Like, you can, you can ball out here. And uh, we've got an international airport. It's easy to get to. <laughs> it's easy to be a company here. It really is. Uh, would I like more exposure? You know? Yeah. My competition's all from, like, LA and San Francisco, right? Um, and they, a lot of money out there for investment, a lot of, you know, the pipeline's strong, you know, they get more shine than us, but whatever, we'll hold the flag, like, you know, I want more food companies here. I think if we show that we're a big success, and maybe more people will start. You know, you got some of the, the young guys coming in, uh, Ryan Florio and, uh, you know, Holmes and everybody, like, let's get more, let's get bigger, let's do better. It's just kind of great here. <laughs> Shit, it's another thing I don't like, but <laughs> it's it's great, man. I mean, I, I was in Tokyo last week. I'm going to LA Tuesday, and I'll be in Austin the following week. And it's so easy to get to that airport. You know, you get to LaGuardia in New York. It's the worst. <laughs> Why would you ever want to live there? <laughs> no, New York's great. I don't live there. But anyway, it's it's a great place to start a business. Great to so start a manufacturing company as well. Uh, so yeah. We like it here for a lot of reasons. Great. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us what flavors you brought? Yeah, so we got seven flavors. Um, classic Caraway. It's the old school tradition. Wow, it's really, it's really loud now. Uh, this is the OG, uh, Luke's grandmother's recipe. Um, classic, simple Caraway. It's a whiskey dill. So we use a little bit of. Uh, a little bit of dill, a little bit of whiskey. It comes off with like a subtle sweetness on the back end. Nice and crunchy. Roasted garlic, this one is probably our best seller. This one or this one. This one has roasted garlic in it, raw garlic, butcher cut black pepper. It goes on everything. It's amazing. Sandwiches, burgers, brats, all kinds of good stuff. Cabbage and cukes. We have actually, we put uh, cucumbers in with the fermentation for 30 days and now you have naturally fermented pickles in every bite. It's delicious. People snack on that one. Beet red, it's your favorite, yeah. Mm -hmm. This thing goes on salads. We're on salad bars in like all the mid-Atlantic region Whole Foods with this guy right here. People just daily use. You ever think sauerkraut would be daily use? Like this one right here, it's on salads all the time. Uh, it's earthy, it's tart, it has red cabbage, beets and carrots. Really beautiful color, pops on Instagram. Curry crop, worst seller. Um, <laughs> partly because it's named curry, if we call it the turmeric crop, which we're seriously thinking about doing, people will go crazy because turmeric is so hot right now. This one's our healthiest sour. You eat this, it's like cleansing your blood. You get turmeric and then you get ginger and it's good for your brain. This stuff is fantastic. Eat it every day. Uh, Nardar, this is the beast. This is the, uh, this is the, the winner right here. It's spicy, it's crunchy. It's kind of like our answer to a kimchi or something like that. Um, but this is the game, this is the game changer. I want the little ice cream cone over here. Try this out. This one will change your mind. <laughs> I take that to heart that you say you don't like sauerkraut. I'm never going to like you. <laughs> I'm just kidding, bro. Um, yeah, so we can try them out. You guys want to pop up here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody needs to try some.